I had so much fun growing up. My younger brothers and I did everything together. We lived in a beautiful sunny place in Queensland. I loved the hot weather and used to run out around everywhere barefoot. My family's always been close. On Saturdays, we'd have barbecues together down by the harbour. The adults would sit on fold up chairs or on blankets on the ground and they'd talk and laugh and share news with one another. Us kids would play chasey in the playground and run around like crazy. Things would get pretty wild when the cousins were all together. Every now and then, someone would fall over and there would be tears. But I never got caught and I never cried once. I was always happy when I was running and I was fast. Sally, or sadly, there was always one person missing from our family fun. My older sister, Anne Marie, couldn't live at home with us. She was born with something called cerebral palsy, which affects the way your brain works. She couldn't run or jump or do any of the things that I loved doing. We only got to visit Anne Marie about three or four times a year. We'd drive for eight to 10 hours. As soon as Anne Marie saw mum, her whole face would light up in excitement. Mum was heartbroken that Anne Marie had to be in care, but she knew that that's where she would get the best treatment. My first ever race could have been a complete disaster. It was an athletics day. I had to represent Gold House in the 80 meter sprint, but I almost missed it because I was hiding in the toilets. Stage fright had set in. I was feeling shy because a few of the parents had turned up to watch us. Eventually, my teacher managed to coax me out of the bathroom. Quickly, she said, hurry or you'll miss it. When the race started, I took off, pumping my legs as fast as I could. I wasn't expecting much. I just ran and somehow I ended up winning. In primary school, I would practice doing sprints with my brothers, Norman and Garth, along a river near home. The dried out riverbed was sandy and heavy to run in. So we had to pump our arms that little bit extra to get anywhere. We always ran in bare feet. The boys were faster than me, but I enjoyed chasing after them. I can still see the brown feet of my youngest brother Garth digging into the ground and flicking up little fountains of sand behind him. If I was chasing him, I'd get a face full of gritty grainy bits, but I loved it. I still remember my very first training at the local track. It was late afternoon and I just kept going around in lane one, my bare feet kicking up the red dust. The late afternoon light in the middle of summer was magical and I didn't have a care in the world. Even after I'd run more than 10 laps, I didn't feel tired, just happy and free. It's hard to explain the feeling I got from running. I was so quiet and shy that most of the time I let my running do the talking for me. I felt safe and strong, like I was the only person in the world. Of course, it wasn't always like that. I went through phases where I didn't want to train. One day, mum told me to go and get ready, but I just lay on my bed and pretended to be asleep. I was sick of not being able to play with my friends as much as I wanted. Finally, mum barged into my room. It's time to go, Catherine, come on. Mum, I don't want to go, I said. I don't want to do this anymore. Mum grabbed hold of my arm. I knew she was really mad. You know your sister can't walk, can't talk, she said. She can't do all the things that you can. You've got two good arms and two good legs. Now go out there and use them. I stared at mum in shock, but she was right. I knew I owed it to Anne Marie to be the best that I could be. I got out of bed and never complained about training again. The more I raced, the more I loved to win, but not everyone was happy about it. I began to notice the dirty looks I was getting. The day I won four out of five events at the country zone athletic titles was a huge achievement for me. My stepdad, Bruce, looked so happy and mum jumped straight up and gave me a hug. Where are your medals? asked Bruce. I didn't get any, I told him. Bruce frowned. You should have got medals. A few weeks later, he found out that the white girls who'd come second to me had been given my medals. He was furious, but he tried not to let it show. Don't worry, Catherine, he said. Nobody can take away the fact that you won those races fair and square. A lot of Indigenous Australians are made to feel like they don't belong here. That's called racism. My grandfather, a talented rugby league player, wasn't allowed to accept an invitation to play in England because he was Aboriginal. 
When I was a kid, no Aboriginal person had won an Olympic gold medal, but I had the crazy idea that one day I would. I found a piece of cardboard and a big black marker pen and wrote in bold capital letters, I'm the world's greatest athlete. I stuck the certificate on my bedroom wall, right opposite my bed. It was the first thing I saw when I woke up every morning and the last thing I saw before I fell asleep at night. It wasn't going to be easy though to make my dream come true. I had to go away to boarding school for starters. It was a huge adjustment, especially at my first school where I was the only Aboriginal girl. Out of hundreds of students, there was only one other black girl and she was a day girl. I missed coming home from school every day and seeing my family smiling and laughing together or singing and playing the guitar. Some nights I cried myself to sleep, burying my face in the pillow so the other girls wouldn't hear. I felt so sad and alone. One night I called mum and we both ended up in tears. Mum, I want to come home, I cried into the phone. All I wanted was to be hugged by my mum. But the next school I went to was right for me. I worked hard and my running took off. One day my coach told me I'd better start practicing my signature. What for? I asked. Soon you'll have to start writing hundreds of autographs. He said I was being entered into the Commonwealth Games trials. A few weeks after the trials, I woke up in the top bunk in my room in Brisbane. Bruce was standing in front of me with a newspaper. He had it open to the page where they listed the athletes. I grabbed it and there was my name. I'd been chosen as one of the four runners in the Commonwealth Games women's 100 metre relay. At only 16 years old, I was going to represent my country. Being at the games in Auckland, New Zealand was a thrill. I kept seeing all these champions, all my idols, and I loved seeing all the different nationalities and cultures. When we actually won the relay, we couldn't stop hugging each other and jumping for joy. By the time they presented us with our medals, the seriousness of the moment had hit me. When they played the national anthem, I sang the words as loud as I could. I was so proud and honored. I was so happy it was like my feet didn't touch the ground. Journalists kept asking me how it felt to be the first Aboriginal person to win a Commonwealth Games gold medal for track and field. Being Aboriginal means everything to me, I said. So many of my friends have the talent but lack the opportunity. I did this for all of us. When I came home and watched a replay on the TV with my family, I was still on an absolute high. Bruce got a phone call and as soon as he hung up, I could tell something was wrong. Anne-Marie has passed away, he said. In that moment, all the world's sunshine was taken away. It took a couple of seconds for mum to realise what she'd heard. Then she just fell apart. She cried out in pain and love. She couldn't believe that her oldest daughter was gone. Anne-Marie had died of an asthma attack. She was only 20. I sat there in shock, feeling like my heart was breaking. How could one moment bring you so much joy and laughter and the next cause you so much pain? I knew what I had to do. I had to run for Anne-Marie. From that day onwards, every race I ran would be for her. Although I'd won a Commonwealth Games gold medal, I was still dreaming about the Olympics. But I didn't just want to compete in relays anymore. I wanted to run in my own event. My coach thought that my running style was best suited to the 400 metre. When I made it to the Olympics in Barcelona, Spain, and I didn't even make the semi-final, it was a huge blow. But when I saw mum, she just sat me down on her lap and hugged me. It's okay, she said, stroking my hair. There'll be other games. Over the next few years, I had wins and losses. And no matter what my family, no matter what, my family was always there for me. Mum was right. Now that I'd had my first taste of the Olympics, I knew I'd be back. And when there was a chance it could be held in Australia in the year 2000, I stayed up late to find out which city would be chosen. And the winner is Sydney. I heard the announcement and started jumping up and down in my lounge room. Now my whole family could come and watch me at the games. It was one more incentive than ever to make it into the team. Finally, it was opening night at the Sydney Olympic Games. The athletes got the call to start moving towards the entrance. As we walked through the stadium tunnels, I couldn't see the people in the crowd, but I could certainly feel them. The concrete slabs above my head were vibrating so much it was as if the walls were talking. We stepped out into the bright lights and there was a jet engine roar from the crowd. Everyone was so proud to be Australian. As soon as they saw us walking towards them, they started screaming or jumping up and down. That night I had a very important job to do. I'd been asked to light the cauldron at the opening ceremony. Yes, 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 I'd cried, of course I will. But it was a secret and the hardest thing of all was not telling anyone, not even my mum. When the flame arrived in the stadium, the first thing I had to do was jog up. 
five flights of stairs covered in flowing water. All I could think was, don't trip and fall. When I got to the top, I paused to catch my breath. I'd made it. My next step was a bit shaky, but I had a huge grin on my face. I turned around to salute the crowd and was nearly blinded by the light as the flashes of thousands of cameras around the stadium went off. I leant over to light the cauldron. It became a ring of fire. Then everything was hauntingly quiet. All I could see was 110,000 people with fluorescent lights calmly swaying in the night. It's only when I think about it now that I realise how many millions of people around the world were watching me in that moment. But I knew that the opening ceremony was just the beginning. My big day was almost here. The 400 metre Olympic final, the biggest race of my entire life. This was the day I'd been thinking and dreaming about since I was a little girl. My chance to win an Olympic gold medal. My desire to win wasn't just about me. I wanted to represent my people. Being Aboriginal gives me strength and makes me proud. Along with the memory of my sister, Anne-Marie, my ancestors inspire me to be all that I can be. But when I heard the final call for athletes, I felt a tiny doubt creep in. I beckoned my coach over. Will people still love me if I lose? I asked. He smiled. Of course they will, he said, but you won't lose. As we walked into the stadium, all I could focus on was my lane. My heart was pumping wildly. It felt like there was electricity flowing through my veins. I took a deep breath. I was ready. On your marks. I got my feet into position and put my hands exactly on the starting line. Then I stared down the track and waited for the gun. Set. Bang! The sound blasted through me and I took off. In the last 60 metres of the race, I felt a noise of the crowd for the first time. Their cheers had a strange effect on me. It was like I was being lifted up and carried towards the finish line. I could feel all this energy around me, the energy of my beloved family and my ancestors, and the energy of Australians everywhere who wanted me to win. I floated across the finish line five metres in front of everyone else. I did it. The wonderful feeling of winning washed over me. But this time it was different. I had just made a dream come true. My longing, yearning, waiting and hard work had paid off. All of a sudden I needed to sit down and take off my shoes. I wanted to feel the air between my toes. It was only then that I let my heart really smile. Off I went, jogging around the track. People had thrown Aboriginal and Australian flags on the ground and I picked up one of each and put them over my shoulders. The Aboriginal flag made me feel so proud with its beautiful colours of black, red and gold. I wanted other Aboriginal kids to see me and think, if she can do it, why can't I? Yeah, I yelled. As I jogged, I felt my eyes drawn towards a certain spot in the crowd and then I saw them, my family. It was a miracle that I could spot them amongst all the thousands of people in the stands. It was as if fate knew that I needed to share this moment with them. I saw my big brother Gavin waving and calling out to me. Mum and Garth were trying to climb over the railing so they could hug me. Norman and my nephew were yelling, one, 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 and Bruce's blue eyes were sparkling. I'd never seen him look so happy. Sometimes I still wonder how it happened. When I was growing up, I didn't feel that different to anyone else, but I've learnt that anyone, no matter who they are, can make the most of what they have. I was born with a good body for running, but I also had a dream, the dream to be the very best I could be. And dreams do come true.